Robert the Devil uh, and William the Conqueror was not a legitimate son. He was so forth initially called William the Bastard. Um, but uh, eventually he got more respect. But he was the only son his father had. Now, normally illegitimate children do not inherit the estate, but uh, Robert the Devil decided to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And a while before going, he made out his will, as people did in those days. Anyone starting on a long trip would make out his will before he went. Robert died on the trip, never returned. So William inherited his father's estate. A lot of persons said William should not be the Duke of Normandy, so some of William's friends and protectors would move him from castle to castle, often hiding young William in a basement. But then William went to England for a while and became playmates to the uh, future King of England, a man named Edward. And, this, and Edward promised William, when I die, I'm going to give my throne to you. Well, both men grew up. The King of England grew up, became king. William grew up, became the Duke of Normandy. He became fairly powerful. Then when the King of England died, some man who did not have blue blood in his veins, there was a man who was not of royal descent, got the throne. William said, I'm going to get the throne. William was, after all, related to the royal line of England. William said, I'm going to go take the throne. So William got together an army, and he conquered England, <clears throat> crossed the English Channel. No foreign army was to invade England again for 700 years till John Paul Jones invaded England during the Revolutionary War. But William invaded England, and it was said when William stepped off the boat, all of a sudden he tripped and someone fell flat on his face, and the people around thought there was a bad omen. William said, hey, folk, look, God has given me England, and he's put it right in my arms. He said this while still lying down with his arms sprawled out. Uh, they fought a battle against the uh, King of England, won it, killed the King of England, or somebody in his army did. Now, and uh, he said himself as king, every king and queen of England from that day till this, with the exception of Oliver Cromwell, who never was a king, every one of them has been descended from William. Um, now, folks, don't write this next down because uh, it's just some little trivia bit I throw in. Trivial for you folk, I guess. But one of the men who followed William was a man named Warnabald from the land of Flanders, which is another way of saying the land of uh, Belgium, uh, for Fleming. Warnabald, as a reward for his helping William, was given a bunch of land in what is today Scotland. Warnabald married a local girl from the land he was given, a Scottish girl, who had the name of Cunningham. <laughs> well, one of all took the name of Cunningham, and his descendants then became the Earls of Cunningham County in Scotland. And there is still a Cunningham, but even though the earldom has long died, in 1802, the last earl died without heirs, and um, they, the Cunningham family did not have a set of system where women could inherit the estate, so uh, the earldom has died. Am I descended from Warnabald? More than likely, yes, and here's why. I mean, you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 1632, 64, 128, 256, 1024, and on up and so forth. By the time you get 30 generations back, folks, you have two million ancestors. Of course, some of them are the, run, the lines run together. Having said that, I'm gonna ask you. If someone offered you a million dollars in your hand right now, or a penny today, doubling every day, two pennies, four pennies, eight pennies, 16 pennies, which you take, oh, well, for 30 days, a penny a day for 30 days, which you take, the penny a day for 30 days, or the million out right in your hand? The pennies. You'd take the penny. I would too. You'd wind up at the end of 30 days with $2 million. You look surprised, do the math. Get you out of your computer at one cent, two cent. Now, for the first 10 days, you'd starve. And day number 10, you'd have 10 bucks. Day number 11, you have 20, and day number, at the, on day number 30, you'd have your $1 million plus the 1 million you got in your first 29 days. That's $2 million. Uh, again, check it out for yourself. I have, I've done it on a computer. Um, so in other words, yeah, we've, probably I'm descended from every Scotsman who has any, who had any descendants who lived about the time one of all did. We have to conquer. All right, the next king that was important was Henry the Second. Henry the Second married Eleanor. 
uh, after she had left her first husband. Actually, I don't know if he kicked her out or she kicked him. They had a really terrible time of it together. Uh, but anyway, um, and, uh, Henry, uh, Henry did not have the authority that he wanted. I mean, these people managed to keep their kings somewhat in check. So Henry got the idea, now how can I get more power? So he thought, I'm going to appoint judges and strengthen the power of the royal courts. He told his judges, use the laws of England. If you can't find a law in the law books, use the code of Justinian. If there's nothing in the code of Justinian or the laws of England, make up your law. Just make up a law and let it become the law. The Lord said, hey, now wait a minute. That's giving too much power to the judges. They got together and got on Henry's case and they worked out a deal to where no law could be made unless the Lord's agreed. Now, why is that relevant today? Because we have given our judges in America too much power and they can't be checked. I mean, we don't have checks and balances, folk. If we had checks and balances, a court decision could be overturned. The last time a Supreme Court decision was overturned by a constitutional amendment was in 1912. The issue was income tax. Congress passed an income tax law. The Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. So Congress and the states, right, the Supreme Court can make a decision five to four. To overturn it, it takes two thirds of both houses and three quarters of the states. Check it out, it's in the Constitution. It's only happened twice in history. One was the infamous Dred Scott decision of 1857 where that the court the Supreme Court declared that black people have no rights. And that was overturned by a four year long civil war. Um, now, I'll tell you how powerful the Supreme Court is. They can even overturn the Constitution. You might say, when did, well, there's an example. The 15th Amendment gave black people the right to vote. The South and Southern states passed laws that restricted black voters for about 100 years. Most of you are familiar with this. The blacks took the case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court had ruled that the Southern states or any state had a right to set up literacy tests or poll taxes in order the tax would guarantee that poor people couldn't vote to keep the blacks on. To pass the literacy test, folk, some of you may have heard this. I mean, I don't mean the opening old wounds, but I don't want to sweep under the rug either. To pass the literacy test, you had to have a white skin. I mean, you, all of you hopefully have heard of this. I mean, this actually went on. Yeah, but anyway, the judges have too much power. And I had a student I thought was liberal. He spoke up one day when I was talking about this. And, and he said, it's going to take one of these days that president will stand up to the courts and say, enough of you, I'm not going to obey you. It's now gotten to so bad that any rinky-dink judge can overturn the president's decision. It's not just the Supreme Court, it's any court. And folks, that is not checks and balances. The courts make all of our moral decisions for us. Our elected officials don't make them. All right, some of these issues we're dealing with, we'll find that others have dealt with them in previous generations also. In the case of Henry II, they were able to kind of rein their courts in right away. Today, it's difficult. Now, eventually, oh yeah, Henry got to where all of England had a what's called a common law. In other words, one county was not under one law, and another county under another law. He enforced a common law throughout all of England. All right, so much for his success, but then he had a real major setback in dealing with a church. Now, folk, the office of Archbishop of Canterbury became vacant. This was before the, call, the, the office of Archbishop met that he was next to Pope himself. So when the Archbishop's office became vacant, Henry thought, ah, I know who I'll appoint. Now, today, kings are not allowed to appoint archbishops. That's done by the church. But Henry appointed Thomas Beckett, thinking, he's my buddy, he's my friend, and he's a worldly-minded man anyway. I mean, oh, Thomas Beckett was truly a member of the church, but he had never been active in church affairs. It's like a president appointing a man to the Supreme Court. Once he sits and gets those robes on, you don't know how he's going to decide. 
Eisenhower can tell you, he said, I've made two mistakes, Earl Warren and Justice Brennan, Justice Warren and Brennan, two big mistakes, because these men will sometimes vote the way you don't want them to. But in the case of Thomas Beckett, once he got on his church clothes, he became a church man. I mean, he became more of a church man than any church man, and he took the church's side on every issue. Even the Pope wrote him a letter, said, Mr. Beckett, will you please kind of tone yourself down? We don't need these issues that you're bringing up. Here were two issues. Issue number one, should clergymen be tried in a secular court or a church court? Like if a clergyman misbehaved, and yes, they had clergymen back then who committed crimes. Henry II said all clergymen should be tried in a secular court. Thomas Beckett said, no, the clergy should be tried in church courts only. They squabbled over this issue. The other was an issue of church lands. A lot of persons, as they were dying, would will lands to the church to try to earn their soul's salvation. Now, folks, this is not my theology, but this is theology of the time. Now, personally, I've been offered many times, donate to us in your will. No, I don't. In my will, it all goes to my children, my family. And if I've reared up my children, right, the church or whatever other institution is, they will get the money anyway, but not by impoverishing the children. But what happened was the church was getting land, acres, mile after mile of land at the expense of children. And every once in a while, a king would come in who said, I've got to take some of this land back. Charles Martel, the hero of Tours, took a bunch of church lands back, and the church said he was going to burn in hell forever over it. Henry tried to take some church lands back also, but as we're about to see, Henry lost his fight with the church, owing to a simple mistake he made. It only took a few seconds for him to do this, and folks, sometimes that can ruin you, a few seconds in your life. Henry was sitting at his table with a bunch of his knights, eating, they might say, eating supper, now, Henry had a violent temper. Anyway, here's at a table, and some page brought in a message from Thomas Beckett. Henry opened it up, and Thomas Beckett refused to do something Henry wanted done. Henry was filled with rage. He looked around the table, all oh, you dogs who sit around my table, can't any of you take care of this upstart for me? Four knights got up from the table, believing that the king wanted Thomas Beckett killed. He really didn't. But anyway, four knights got up from the table. They went to visit Thomas Beckett. Make a long story short, they put Thomas Beckett in the sword. All of England and all of Christendom, in fact, rose up in protest. Thomas Beckett became a martyr. His tomb became a shrine. People who were sick would visit his tomb, hoping his spirit could make them well. <clears throat> and if you visit Westminster Abbey today, his statue is still there. He became a martyr and a hero. Henry had to do penance for the rash deed. I mean, justifiably, Henry was blamed, not the knights who had killed him, because the knights believed they were doing what Henry wanted them to do. Henry had to give up and let the church courts try the clergymen, and he had to let the church keep their lands. Now, later kings came along who turned this thing around. All right. Um, the next king of England is King John. Now you might notice, I don't have a number after John's name. Well, actually, William, this is William the first. And by the way, the next, well, two persons in line for the throne is named William, the second person in line. And he'll become William the fifth if he ever becomes king. There have been four kings named William. In the case of John, the royal family does not name its children John. There have been one or two exceptions to that. But the ones they named John have never gotten the throne. They've named some of their younger sons John. John was one of the most wicked kings England ever had. He hung around with a bad crowd. He drank a lot and talked about fits. John was the son of Henry. I mentioned how Henry was capable of throwing fits. In John's case, he would actually lose himself. He'd get around and fall on the floor and wallow at the mouth and. Uh, just completely talk out of his head. I mean, uh, he, might, he might have been suffering from epilepsy, and even the dogs would take off running like crazy away from him. I mean, he, he, would, he would blow his top. Well, 
John one day went to France. I mean, after all, through his mother, Eleanor, he had inherited uh, some land in France. He spent some time in France. And when he came back, he started hearing rumors about a charter. When he got to Runnymede, he found all the nobility there waiting for him. And to a man, the nobles said, your majesty, you still, we still want you to be our king. And keep in mind, assassinations were rare in the Middle Ages. People just simply did not put their hand on the Lord's anointed. But we want you to know that there are certain things you cannot do. And they have 15 articles. You may not do this. You may not do that. You know. John looked around and saw the whole, all the nobles in the realm were against him. He signed. The Magna Carta has gone down in history as being one of the greatest documents that limited the power of the government and gave rights to the ordinary common person. Um, and many years later, Winston Churchill was to say that England might have owed more to the vices of John than it did to the virtues of many of its great statesmen. But anyway, uh, England then limited the power of its kings now, one book I read, a history book in graduate school, put it this way. Unlike France, which has no king, unlike Germany, which has no king, England still has its kings and queens. Every king of England has been descended from King John. Every queen has been descended from King John, including Queen Elizabeth II. But these kings have no real authority. The, the kings, beginning with John, the king's power got less and less and less through the generations. One of the kings even had his head chopped off. King Charles the, uh, the first had his head chopped off. But eventually it got to where the king has no authority whatever, and one time I catch his post, Queen Elizabeth II, many years ago, expressed an opinion. All she was expressed an opinion, which is something every Englishman has a right to do, but she can't. The Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, sternly rebuked said, you are to keep your mouth shut. You are not allowed to do that. And the Queen quietly acquiesced. She knew she'd broken all the rules of being Queen. She's not even allowed to express an opinion on parliamentary matters. But, uh, anyway, of course, only the Prime Minister is allowed to chew the Queen out. No one else. But uh, anyway, um, one book called them their pathetic, his pathetic successors. But nevertheless, there's still the one. Well, when World War I started, three of Queen Victoria's grandsons had the title of emperor. The emperor of Russia, the emperor of Germany, and the emperor of England. Three of them had the title of emperor. When the war was over, only the king of England still had the title of emperor. The Tsar of Russia was executed. The Tsar, of, the Kaiser of Germany was deposed, but England still had its kings and queens. All right. Um, now, finally, the last one we want me to remember is Edward the First. He was the grandson of King John. Uh, there was another one between Henry the Third, but. Uh, We'll skip Henry III. He's not that important for this lesson. Edward I is remembered for convening the first parliament. Edward I. Now, here's why. I mean, the power of the king was limited. I mean, I've ever had to, his grandfather and forced to sign a Magna Carta. He realized the power was limited, but he needed money. And he thought, how can I get money? He was not allowed to just raise the tax. So he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll call all the nobles to come to my palace, and I'll get them all in one big room in my palace. This was the first parliament. The word parliament is a French word, but keep in mind, these kings right here at this point were also, they had a lot of the land in France that they inherited from Eleanor. So Edward I called together all the nobles. Now, um, I mean, I know you're going to say today, yes, the nobles still meet, but the House of Lords and Parliament has no authority. But in those days, he called together the House of the, well, the Parliament, and he told them 
and I, I need this, I need this, and I need that, and this will benefit you. If I can build this, it'll help you, but I need money. Parliament granted him the money he requested. After all, he asked them nicely for it, and they gave him the money, and this was the beginning of Parliament. Eventually, Parliament became very powerful. Edward II, the son of Edward I, was so bad a king that Parliament voted him out of office, and uh, they retired Edward II. In addition, I mentioned how the Parliament once chopped the king's head off. Then, um, Parliament became very powerful. The House of Lords was to replace the House of Commons until the day when probably the House of Commons replaced the House of Lords. But that's jumping ahead of the story a little bit. Um, all right, so much for England now. Going to France. I'm skipping over a lot of French history also, but in the case of France, started a new compete. Now, when the last Carolingian, I mean, okay, the, the dynasty started by Pepin the Short, was called the Carolingian dynasty, named after Charles Martel. When the last Carolingian proved to be worthless, the people of France decided to elect a king, and they elected Hugh Capet, with the understanding on their part that when Hugh Capet died, the nobles would assemble and meet, and they would elect the next king. And France was here not going to be electing its kings. This might have been a bad idea, but anyway, it didn't work that way. Now, this was to be repeated in the 1700s when France was promised democracy. They were promised democracy in 1792. They finally got it in 1871. About 80 years later, after they were promised that France got to democracy. But in this case, then owing to the fact, all right, Hugh Capet apparently had read his Bible. In those days, only kings could have, or high nobles could afford a Bible. But Hugh Capet noticed in the Bible, David, when he got old, he crowned Solomon, his son, as the next king. So Hugh Capet crowned his son as the next king. That king grew up, got old, and he crowned his son. On and on down the line, and all the kings of France began crowning their sons while they were still alive. And, to make a long story short, your nobles got to where they did not pick a king anymore. Now, I want to remind well, maybe you're not remind, maybe you've never heard this before. Now, among the upper, upper classes, you don't get to be upper, upper class unless your father you know that you inherit it. Now, for instance, Abraham Lincoln in American history was not considered a member of the upper upper class, although he was pretty nice, but his sons were. Uh, you only get to be upper upper if you inherit it. In the case of the kings, you might not be aware that even with kings, if, you're, if your father were a king, but you had an older brother and your older brother died, Therefore, you were the king's second son. You did not get the respect that you would if you had been the king's oldest son. But if you were a king when your father had not been a king, you could expect to not get the respect. Now, I've already told you how that William the Conqueror, <clears throat> the king of the people of England, set a man on a throne who didn't even have blue blood in his veins, who <clears throat> had no genealogy of the kings in his ancestry. He lasted about two years before William overthrew him. Blue blood was really highly regarded. And, um, all right, but there was one nation in Europe that did manage to set up a elected king, an office where every king was elected. That nation was Poland. Poland was divided between Russia, Prussia, and Austria in the 1700s, and for about 150 years, Poland was not even on a map. Poland was a very weak nation, its kings got no respect from the other kings of the Europe because of Europe because they were not hereditary monarchs. You only got respect if your father were a king, and you only got respect if you were the oldest son of your father. If you weren't, you got a little bit less respect than you otherwise would. This is the way that the upper upper classes still look on um, the other, their own people today. You only are a member of the upper upper class if you were born into it. You can't earn it. Now, if you really, really get wealthy or get high up, a high achiever, your children might be considered upper upper class, but you have to. Uh, but you cannot become upper upper, upper upper class unless you're born into it. Um, 
In the case of Poland, the Polish people are some of the smartest people on earth, but uh, some of you might know that a generation ago, the world was making all kinds of jokes called Polak jokes, none of which I'm going to repeat here. But the Polish people were very upset at that, and I can, can't say the blame. But one time a Polish man asked an American, is it true that you American people make jokes about us? The American him a little bit. Finally, I had to answer, well, yes, we do. The Polish man said, I'm sorry to hear about that. The Russians do too. And again, folks, the Polish people I've known have been extremely intelligent, but they have done things throughout their history. I mean, they went to war against Adolf Hitler with mounted cavalrymen, horsemen. This, this actually is in the records, folks. They actually did. I mean, and I always tell this story at this point. When I was at Lockheed one day, I was working with some engineers, and one day one of the engineers bought a flashlight they couldn't fix. So we asked this team of engineers to work on it. Well, the engineers said, oh, okay. They got out their voltmeter. They checked the battery. The battery had the proper voltage. Well, okay, the battery's good. Then they checked, well, is the voltage getting to the switch? So they checked the voltage first to one side of the switch. Then they turned the switch on, and voltage to the other side of the switch. Then they traced the voltage to the socket. The voltage was getting to the socket, then why was the bulb coming on? Then they unscrewed the bulb and checked the continuity of the bulb and found the bulb was burned out. This actually, I mean, I witnessed this myself. This actually happened anyone. But the problem was these men were just too smart to do a simple task like checking out a bulb and a flashlight without going through a whole bunch of procedure to determine if it were the bulb or not. Um, all right, anyway, I'll leave that. Um, all right, Hugh Capet started the dynasty that was to last about three or four hundred years. And then, um, now, for several generations, France had no strong king. Actually, the first six kings of France, of the Capetian dynasty, did not assert themselves. But one day, one of them finally did. There's a story that one of the kings was sitting at a table and they were discussing how bad things were in France. And again, without a king, the nobles were running wild. I mean, I could tell you something about how wicked some of the nobility got. And the people of France began to say, we need a strong king, we need a stronger king. Well, they finally got a king who asserted himself, but uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes. But it harks back to something Socrates told us 2,300 years ago. When you give people too much freedom, after a while they start demanding some kind of law and order. I've already mentioned the president was.